Welcome to the third installment of Bosses Ranked by Law, a series where we rank every boss in Dark Souls based on how powerful they are according to their lore. Today we're going to go over the final installment of the Dark Souls trilogy. Throughout the video, I'll be using item descriptions, community insights, environmental details, in-game narration, and many other sources of information to consolidate an accurate ranking. Dark Souls 3 does an amazing job of cornering lore-related loose ends, and even pays homage to some of the prime beings from the first installment to help us really contextualize how the reigning powers of old compare to those at the end of the timeline. The top entries on this list are some of my favorite entries I've ever done and I was sure to really add that extra level of narration and lore building to really encapsulate that. As always, these are all my opinions. Though I spend months of research on each boss and collaborate with a few others to make sure I get things right, there is some level of speculation and subjective world building all Souls games require. That's the beauty of the game though, and it's why our community thrives as well as it does. As is every video of this series, we're going from the ground up, and right at the bottom of the list is the Cursed Rotted Greatwood. The story of the Cursed Rotted Greatwood is less a story of a being that came to strength on the back of hardship and triumph, and more so the environmental consequences of a land beaming with undead destined to either fester in a cycle of death and rebirth, or become sacrificial fodder for Aldrich. What we need to take away from this is that the undead settlement was the furthest place from any semblance of purity and peace. In this, it's not surprising therefore to find the land the settlement was founded on also felt the stagnation of the undead curse. The soul of the rotted great word tells us that ever since its establishment, all manners of curses have managed to seep into the undead settlement. The worst of them were sealed away inside a spirit tree, but eventually the curses took their toll. It's evident that the spirit tree in question was the original form of the cursed rotted great word. Although there is very little context as to what the spirit tree functioned as in the world before the hollowing, it's likely the creator of the series Miyazaki drew inspiration from the Dharma of ancient Japanese mythology that denotes a tree that harbors old spirits that form its personality. It's therefore unsurprising to know that once this tree becomes festered by the tortured hollows of the later undead settlement, it too would take on a tortured appearance. When we meet the cursed rotted great wood, it is entirely cursed, blistered with pus, and surrounded by fallen undead. In terms of strength, there is very little given context about its overall ability to exist as a threat, which is further exemplified by its initial passivity to the player. In valuing its strength, we really have to go off the basics its size. Taking on an extremely large size and weight hefty enough to cave in the ruins of the undead settlement, we can assume the cursed rotted great wood bears most of its combat prowess in its ability to utilize its weight, which is brought down significantly by its impractical shape and inability to utilize distinct forms of projectiles. One saving grace of the being is that it is harboring the amalgamation of what is presumed to be thousands if not millions of undead. Without any narrative context as to what this provides for the tree outside of its size, we have already surmised, it's difficult to attribute its strength to this merit. For this reason, the Cursed Rotted Great Wood has only its monumental size and its ability to shift this weight as a means of defense. For this reason, it is the weakest boss in Dark Souls 3. The next entry is going to be the first on the list which will require an overreaching level of speculation. As their origins and purpose are elaborated on to a small degree even relative to the standards we expect of the Cryptic Soul series. In truth, if we're able to be realistic, it's likely the Champion Gravetender and Gravetender Wolf are just landmark bosses that exist to grant the player the multiplayer PvP aspect of the game that was later added after the first DLC. 
But in a lot of ways, the absence of narrative lets me have a bit more fun with this entry than others I will be speaking about. At the face of it, through the descriptions of the champion's bones and Valahar, we learn that the Grave Tender and Great Wolf are beings that celebrated the art of undead matches as a means of celebrating combat and subsequently finding purpose in this celebration in order to retain their ailing and hollowing minds. A distinct fact about this boss is that it's one of a few bosses in the entire trilogy that do not bear a unique soul, indicating a lack of relevance to both the story and the nature of their strength in the world. Already on the back foot from this realisation, let's see if we can redeem their strength from other aspects of their existence. The boss has one great redeeming factor. Both the Great Wolf and Grave Tender are beings that were likely members of a coven of fighters that fought till they were unable to fight anymore. And the fact that they are still standing alone and left with the task of looking over the dead champions bring extra credit to their own prowess. In this, we can reasonably assume they were once skilled fighters, likely of nobility in their respective circles. But where do they lie in the grand picture of bosses? In truth, even the beings that they pay homage to, which are Arturus and Sif, they pale in comparison on all fronts. Their lack of soul exemplifies this and the description of the Valahar tells us the champions were without rest and at the point we meet them lost of mind. We aren't fighting a champion of the ages, we are fighting a former gladiator of notable esteem, who by the time that we encounter him has gone completely hollow. Bearing distinction in their fighting style and the Great Wolf's ability to use frost, they are however more distinct than some more common hollows, and their synergy is not to be understood as anything but a challenge and a perfect guardian to the right of the gladiatorial tradition. Their tried and tested skills and fighting and unique synergy bring them to a position above the curse-rotted Great Wood's less sophisticated strengths. Wolnir is a slightly difficult one for me, as in truth if we are talking about High Lord Wolnir, the being that was able to conquer a major portion of the world's kingdoms, bring to knees the ruling lords and take on the position of a worldly overlord, we may be looking at a being that was stronger than any king before him. Someone who likely harboured the power not only worthy of the right of rekindling the first flame, but also enough that he could challenge the nature of the world itself. We are told in great detail about Wolnir's ability to impose himself across the world and how he conquered the lands and shattered the crowns of those before him to create his own. There is even a fun lore relation you can make to Wolnir and the protagonist from Dark Souls 2, who was able to conquer the kingdoms and join the crowns to overcome the curse of hollowing, but that is treading on pure speculation. Wolnir would eventually raise the kingdom of Carthus on his victories. Carthus would dominate the lands and lay claim to the desert as one high ruler. In the nature of Walnir's being was domination, but soon he would face a force that rarely gave in to submission, especially by an overly ambitious human. It's likely Walnir, after conquering the desert would find the abyss, and in this abyss would manifest the art of dark spellcasting and a malformed version of pyromancy. However, his dive into attempting to dominate this source of power would eventually backfire and he would find himself stuck between the earth and the fog of the the abyss. As he lay in the depths of the abyss, he found himself much like beings before him being encapsulated by the abyss and his humanity running wild, ready to be consumed and brought to one by the birthplace of the dark soul itself, and in a desperate plea would call for the gods to save him, stripping the corpses of clerics he would find in the abyss and clinging to the faith of sunlight to dialectically oppose the abyss, slowly consuming his being. Being. When we're assessing Walnir's strength in this form, we have to acknowledge the version we fight is not the Walnir that conquered the land and became High Lord of one of the greatest, most expansive territories in the series, but a being that is desperately begging for life at the mercy of the gods as he is being torn in two by the Abyss. 
Wolnir as we meet him is nothing more than a torso gripping onto the world in a plea to continue living. His holy sword indicates the only aspect keeping Wolnir alive here are his holy armbands, and in this defeating Wolnir requires only the ability to destroy his armbands as he desperately utilises the little movement he has left in his hands and holy sword, alongside a small array of spells he is still able to cast in an effort to defend himself and fend you off. Walnir in his most capable form was likely one of the greatest combatants ever. Talented in various arts from a twisted and unique version of pyromancy and likely even more proficient in Carthus's unique swordsmanship and held a soul that encapsulated what is presumed to be Lord Souls themselves. However, the Walnir we meet is barely able to swing his arms, let alone a sword, and is rendered a shadow of his former self in terms of spellcasting. In reality, the great threat of Volnir is the abyss that is actively consuming him, something for comparative reasons we cannot even directly contribute to Volnir himself, for the power of the abyss is a natural occurrence and he has no influence in its workings. The saving grace for Volnir in terms of his power is the fact that he is still able to fight off the abyss up to this point. It is for these reasons Volnir ranks this low on the list. When we finished off the ranking of Dark Souls 2, we spoke about the ultimate triumph of one of, if not the most inspiring figure in the entire trilogy, the Ivory King. If you remember, his final act was to sacrifice himself to inherit a permanent stalemate against the remnants of the Bed of Chaos. In Dark Souls 2, we can attribute not seeing a single demon from Isolith to the Ivory King's sacrifice. However, by the time that Dark Souls 3 has rolled around, it's clear his actions combined with that of Ulsana's had absolutely devastated what remained of the Bed of Chaos, for there are only a few demons left, and most notably in the main game is the Demon King. When it comes to context, there is little to really know about the Demon King, and in many ways it doesn't really matter to this video or even to the narrative his existence is attempting to convey, as the Demon King by the time we meet him is described by his soul as a shriveled old Demon King, now like a clump of burnt ash, but he is the last living witness of the chaos of Isolith. In this, we know the Demon King existed at the same time as the Witch of Isolith, and shared a home with all the primal demons we discussed in the first Dark Souls video. From the centipede demon Isolith herself, the legendary demon Fire Sage, and even the Daughters of Chaos. What is to be spoken of his position in the hierarchy of Isolith at this time is hard to know. Was he a king in the time of Isolith or was he a rising lieutenant and a figure on his quest to royalty? In truth, it doesn't really matter, for he is referred to as a king, and by the time we meet him, it's unlikely his kingship is colloquial, as he is the only primal demon left with a hint of Isolith's fire still in him in the main game. Surrounded by corpses of his primal brethren, he is crippled but has outlasted his peers, a testament to his sheer power and determination. Thankfully for us, when we face off, he has little to show for himself, existing essentially as a reflection of the Bed of Chaos's current position in the world, echoes of a race born from the gods of this age only to be prematurely suffocated. The battle with the old Demon King is likely to be as much a difficult battle as it is a favour to euthanise the unwavering stubbornness of the fires of Isolith. The Demon King ranks above the cursed rot of Greatwood and Grave Tender purely on the merit that he at least has an extraordinary level of power to show for his former self, and although unlikely much of that has been retained in the time that we meet him, he still holds the distinct ability to conjure firestorms and utilises the fiery essence of his old Warhammer. And an artifact from the primal age and evidence of the old demon king's remaining influence over the force that even Prime Gwyn feared. half light Spear of the Church is just another boss that is difficult to place based on how little we understand about his power in relation to anything else at all. But just as the other listings go, there are still clues we can use to reach a sufficient conclusion. 
Half-Light was a missionary who was a part of a mission that travelled to the Ringed City. It's not mentioned the nature of this mission, but it's likely something not too dissimilar to a spiritual retreat, as they are told to have visited the incredibly sacred site of Filianor's resting place. Filianor would later be understood as one, if not the last living descendants of Gwyn, that bore what is likely to be the most important task in the entire bloodline, the preservation of the Ringed City. While the entirety of Half-Light's company chose to leave, Half-Light himself likely in awe of the Ring City and its place in the preservation of the Age of Fire, elected himself to stay behind and act as a guard for Filianor, in service of the Justiciers that held charge of its defences. In this, we can learn a few things of the strength of Half-Light. One is that the gods allowed Half-Light to stay in the Ringed City. The Ringed City itself is an incredibly sacred place the gods intentionally kept far away from the hands of prying forces. Half-Light being granted the opportunity to watch over Filianor likely meant he was either incredibly trustworthy as an agent of fire or powerful enough to be elected to such a high position. In reality, it's probably a mix of the two and therefore demands notation as an important important aspect of his strength, placing him even in the most prudent of manners, leagues ahead of his missionary counterparts. We also learn that Half-Light has extensive knowledge on sorcery as described by his robes, but also he was able to command a very unique aspect of sorcery that manifests itself as a form of light. Although the use of sorcery as a form of light magic has been seen in the past in the form of Ulasil and Hazel, we've never been able to see this form of magic being used in a form that has been offensive. The only character we see having this ability is Half-Light. The creation of new sorceries are something that have historically underpinned some of the greatest beings in Dark Souls, from Seath to Big Hat Logan and Pontiff Sullivan. So in this breath, we can assume a further notation on the degree of power Half-Light commands at the time that we do meet him. Although some argue his ability to manifest light magics are not his own invention, I will for the sake of this video assume alternatively, as Half-Light is the only known sorcerer that bears these distinct powers. But we also know Half-Light does not drop a soul of distinction or namesake. Furthermore, he isn't expressed to have claimed any notable victories or achievements in relation to his life outside of earning the position that he would hold at the Ringed City. We also learn that he was not alone in the position that he did hold, but rather was just the final defender left in the Ringed City at the time that we enter. In this, if we weigh the strengths and weaknesses and then hold some level of prudence due to a few educated assumptions we've had to make, I feel like Half-Light ranks perfectly here on the list. The story of the Deacons of the Deep is in truth the story of Sullivan, the story of MacDonnell and the story of Aldrich. We'll go into much further depth regarding who the Deacons were in relation to all those stories, but what we can do here is assess what the Deacons were and what their power inhibited. But to summarise, the Deacons of the Deep were once members of the Way of the White, devout to the rulers of old, built on the clergy of Gwyn's ruling order. Their purpose was naught but clerical. However, there were delegations within the Way of the White that bear duties distinct to one another. In Dark Souls 3, we learn of a delegation that were dutied with a very special task. Not too far from Anolondo, a special site was uncovered that bear a place affectionately named the Deep. Unstable as it was mysterious, the old rulers saw it fit to place a collective of priests to oversee the Deep, and these priests would go on to create an institution to commit to this responsibility. This institution would be called the Church of the Deep. The Church of the Deep would quite efficiently watch over the Deep and appease many of the abhorrent beings that would spill over. However, amongst their ranks, a few notable figures would give rise, notably the three Archdeacons and St. Aldrich. The Archdeacons and St. Aldrich would slowly become affected by the elements of the Deep, St. Aldrich would develop a hunger for human flesh, and the Archdeacons would uncover a philosophy that would change the world forever. 
While Aldrich would become a tool used by the wider powers at B, the Archdeacons would subtly develop their understanding of the Deep, and once Aldrich was coerced into taking the mantle of the Lord of Cinder, the Archdeacons, most notably MacDonald spearheaded by Sullivan, would develop the philosophy of the Deep, a collection of ideas that saw a new future for the world, a future that was heretical to the way of the White. Eventually, with the help of Sullivan's rise to power, the Archdeacons would formally separate from the Way of the White and reimagine the Church of the Deep as not overseers of the Deep, but shepherds of its influence. MacDonald, having developed an affinity for the soul dregs that filled the pits of the chasm, would teach his congregation and his fellow Archdeacons of deep sorcery, an extension of their heresy and rebellion against the Age of Fire, formally renouncing their heritage, the Church of the Deep and its ministers would change forever under MacDonald's new worldview. Once Aldrich was returned to the land through the Bells of Awakening, he too would be emboldened by MacDonald's teaching and commit himself to materialising the Age of the Deep due to the alienation he and all the other previous Lords of Cinder had felt after linking the fire. While Sullivan committed to puppeteering Aldrich and MacDonald exiled himself to the depths of Irithyll, Archdeacon Royce, a close confidant of MacDonald, assumed the role of overseeing the master coffin of Aldrich. It's in this state that we meet the deacons of the deep, a congregation of the now transformed ministers of the deep commanded by Archdeacon Royce, MacDonald's contemporary. When assessing their strength, there is not too much to say for them, but this is not to swipe under the rug the power they did hold. We learn through some of the game context and from Sullivan that the Deep and subsequently the sorcery of the Deep is an incredibly powerful and mutating force, and this is the major hallmark of the Deacons of the Deep, their ability to command Deep sorcery as a totality. In terms of strength, the ministers of the deep were not known for power, but rather influence and persistence. The challenge itself is likely one of attrition, as individually the deacons bear little strength, but as a totality, it's likely to be a challenging task due to their command over a form of sorcery that even the greatly influential Pontiff Sullivan saw as a medium intrinsic to success in his incredibly ambitious campaign. The deacons are not warriors or combatants, and there is little indication of their strength as such a force, but they are masters of the deep, a sorcery so encompassing even gods turn their heads at its presence. We also know they are found in a whole congregation at the foot of the resource that encapsulates this power. In this, the deacons of the deep find themselves here on the list. Now I'm going to be completely open with you guys on this one. The Ancient Wyvern in Dark Souls 3 is the hardest to place on this list. There is so little context as to its origins, its association with Everlasting Dragons, or even where it stands in terms of its lineage. We do know there are two pieces of item descriptions we can go off of, but after that I will indulge you all in a bit of speculation. The dragon headstone in the ancient dragon great shield tells us that the ancient wyvern is either an ascended dragon worshipper or a descendant of the everlasting dragons that fell closer to its lineage than those before it. Now time for some speculation. Let's get the basic out of the way. The ancient wyvern demonstrates a great degree of strength from its appearance, from being able to breathe fire, its enormous size, comparable even to the ancient dragon from Dark Souls 2 that was an imitation of everlasting dragons. The next bit of speculation is to draw parallels between what we know and how closely they fall in line with other notable descendants of everlasting dragons that even in my very own list drew grand merit on the basis of the proximity to the Everlasting Dragons, as Everlasting Dragons were, for the most part, one of the greatest forces in the entire trilogy, a force that required the combined strength of all four lords, including the furtive pygmy, to bring down. In my estimations, due to the ancient dragon's attributes as shown to us, it's obvious the ancient wyvern, though lesser than a dragon in name, holds many of the characteristics we can expect from some of the greatest descendants of the original everlasting dragons. Its dominance over the terrain of the dragon's peak further elevates its position as a being worthy of praise. 
However, it's not all praise for the Ancient Wyvern. Unlike every other descendant of the Everlasting Dragons I've ranked quite high on the list thus far, the Ancient Wyvern does not have a single indication in the lore that it is a being of any esteem at all. There are no indications it was even related to any Everlasting Dragon. There are no words on its achievements or influence it had in the land. If we take, for example, Black Dragon Calamite from the first game, it's explicitly stated it was feared by even Anolondo. If we even even take the gaping dragon from the first game, there is mention that it was a royal member of the ancient dragons who descended from the everlasting dragons, very explicitly. It's for this reason the ancient wyvern ranks as low as it does, as despite its size and attributes akin to a close descendant of the everlasting dragons, there are no notations or any form of lore description we can use to assess it as such. The Dragonslayer armor is not the most lore expansive entry on this list, but there are a few clues we have to its origins, identity, and overall strength. The first major clue we guess about the Dragonslayer armor is through the soul dropped on their death. The soul of the Dragonslayer armor tells us the Dragonslayer armor, controlled by pilgrim butterflies, lost its master long ago, but still remembers their sporting hunts. In this, we know two things. The first is that the Dragonslayer armor we face off against is not an entity of its own, but something similar to an automaton controlled by the Pilgrim Butterflies. We get more clues as to the nature of this relationship when it's revealed that the Wolf Knight's Greatsword, a weapon that deals extra damage to beings of the Abyss, has the same effect on the Dragonslayer armor, reinforcing the notion that the Pilgrim Butterfly is the sole entity in control here. We learn that the Pilgrim Butterflies are an ascended form of the Pilgrims of New Londo, a place that offered refuge to the old factions of Karth, inherently tied to humanity and the Dark Soul. For a better understanding of this relationship, I really encourage all of you to check out my video called In Search of the Dark Soul. Shameless plug aside, the second thing we learn from the description of the Dragonslayer armor is on its origins. It's very likely that the Dragonslayer armor was originally the armaments worn by the Dragonslayers that would carry the mantle of the old captain of Gwyn's Knights, Ornstein, and bear the namesake and image of the famous Dragonslayer. It's very likely the beings that would don the armor have either turned hollow or withered away and the remnants of their shell became vehicles for the pilgrims to exert further influence on the land. Combining Ornstein-esque lightning-imbued weaponry and armor that is indicated to almost be impenetrable as per the nature of their shield and plate mail, it's likely the Dragonslayer armor is a challenge that tests any chosen undead's cunning and strength, likely falling short of the champions they were originally inspired by, but retaining the memory of the strength that secured their position as worthy representatives of Ornstein's legacy. Their presence alongside the enhancing characteristics of the pilgrims secures their position here on the list. Ayudex Gondia is the first boss we face in Dark Souls 3, and it's actually very fitting in relation to the overarching narrative of the game. Ayudex Gondia came to Lothric to link the First Flame, likely after the actions of the Twin Princes and their abandonment of linking the First Flame. Gondia, originally a champion of the land, was understood to be powerful enough to bear the mantle of the Chosen Undead, but his journey was cut short when he had arrived into a Lothric that had abandoned the tradition altogether, likely due to Osiris's exile and Lothric's apathy. In this, Gondir came to Lothric without a firekeeper or a bonfire to kindle, and therefore unable to fulfill his goal to link the first flame. It's not mentioned how Gondir would react to this, but it's likely Gondir faced some degree of internal turmoil at this realization, and an unnamed hero would come and force Gondir into submission by shackling him to the grounds of Firelink Shrine and impaling him with a coiled sword destined for an undead in the future who would take on Gondir's original mantle and link the first flame. This turned the once champion of Ash Gundir into more of a judge, an obstacle and benchmark for any chosen undead fit to kindle the first flame and therefore worthy of the coiled sword and firekeeper in the future. 
Evidence of Gundia's turmoil at the realisation he would have to rescind his lofty ambitions of becoming the chosen undead is evidenced in our fight with him in his Ayudex form. As once brought to half health, he transforms into a manifestation of the Pus of Man. The Pus of Man is eerily reminiscent of Manus and is likely analogous to the internal turmoil faced by the judge manifesting his humanity into a raging form. The strength of the Ayudex is likely not the full capacity of the champion who would link the first flame years ago. The years of imprisonment and the piercing of his heart definitely contribute to his ability to fight, which is further evidenced by his much slower movement in comparison to the past form of him we face. Gundir does have one enhancing distinction here though, the pus of man having manifested within him. Something that doesn't necessarily indicate he is stronger for it, but at least more aggressive to those who would challenge him. Being a lesser form of the version of himself that held the capacity to link the first flame, Ayudex Gundir still a challenge the kingdom believed to be necessary for any chosen undead to demonstrate their initial capacity to journey towards linking the first flame. And it's for this reason he ranks here on the list. There is an elite group of knights in Dark Souls, so powerful their presence, though quantitatively sparse in the world, holds such immensity that they extend the influence of one of the world's most prominent forces, the Sauron of Dark Souls, only known as Pontiff Sullivan. Though context on the pontiff's strength will come later in the video, one thing is clear. His campaign is likely the most prominent and successful in the timeline. What we do need to know here is that the pontiff did not cast his influence with little foresight, and integral to his winning formula were the Outrider Knights. As per the description of the pontiff's left eye, he entrusted upon his warriors a ring that granted him omnipresence in the land, but also an immense twisting strength to the beholders. The most prominent and long-lasting warriors would eventually turn into beasts. And when we look at the description of the Irithyll straight sword, it indicates the closer the warrior is to being a beast, the longer they have served the pontiff's hounding black eye, and likely the more successful they were as a force for the pontiff. Outrider knights alone are described as savage raving warriors, but no other knight was as savage and raving as Vought of the Boreal Valley. When we meet Vought he is fully actualized as a beast. Emma even refers to Vought as a dog, but he wasn't always this way as we can see his spectre roaming Irithyll fully humanoid, testament to the transformative strength of the pontiff's rings and influence. In assessing the strength of Vought, we have to remember a few things. Firstly, Vought is a subject of Pontiff Sullivan, a being that exerted such great influence, he is likely one of the main reasons of the premise of Dark Soul 3's main storyline. It was the Pontiff's actions that reinforced the twin princes from continuing the cycle of inheriting Gwyn's prophecy. And when we equate the means to which the Pontiff was able to build such great influence in the world, we have to look towards the immensity of his outrider knights, and amongst these knights Vought stands parallel to only one other as the most influential. Secondly, Vought's physicality is mentioned several times through the game. From Emma to the description of his armoury, we are told of the immense physical and elemental capacity of Vought explicitly in the game. Such descriptions are scarce in the entire Soul series, so it holds more merit than you would assume at face value. Finally, we learn that the Outrider Knights were classified in strength on the basis of how far they were to their transformation in totality, as in this transformation they became more savage and raving, and none were as savage and raving as Vought, as he was the single-handedly most mutated of all Outrider Knights we meet in Dark Souls. With these three assertions, we can assume Vought this position on the list. The Outrider Knights and their association with the monumental force of the Pontiff alone bring great credence to their capacity to fight, but Vought rises above even them in distinction, assuming this position on the list. What else would you expect from the Hound of the God-Defeating Pontiff?
Of the most prominent forces in Dark Souls 3, the Undead Legion of Farron rank far ahead of most of the remaining factions. Fashioned after the stories of Artorius, they are inspired by the aspect of the wolf. The Undead Legion of Farron held most of its influence in its ultra-orthodox stance on the Abyss and the aspects of the Dark. Taking heed of Artorius' final mission against the Abyss, the members of this covenant were made up of the most capable beings in Lothric, from warriors to even legendary sorcerers such as the Crystal Sage. The Undead Legion of Farron were headed by a pact of men known as the Abyss Watchers. Sitting right atop the hierarchy of enforcers, they were responsible for the first line of defense against any aspect of the Abyss, and even struck preemptively and disproportionately at the slightest indication of dark influence. It's noted heavily through dialogue with Hawkwood and item descriptions that the Abyss Watchers were capable of leveling entire kingdoms for the sake of containing the Abyss. There are environmental clues to even indicate that the great kingdom of Carthus was buried and brought to rubble by the actions of the Abyss Watchers, likely due to Walnir's endeavours into the Abyss. The influence of the Abyss Watchers would become so prominent that once the flames began to fade, they, fearing the Abyss and acting preemptively, would overcome the challenges to link the first flame for the first time as a group. In this, we learn that the Abyss Watchers were inherently connected due to their wolf blood, something that indicates a shared soul. It's unclear when the Abyss Watchers became undead and tainted by the Abyss themselves, as questions about if this happened after they linked the flame or after rebirth is unclear. But by the time we meet them, revived by the Bell of Awakening due to Lothric's choice to ignore the flame, the Abyss Watchers have returned to Farron, sitting at the site of the now buried Carthus, likely drawn to Walnir's persisting influence. It's not indicated why the Abyss Watchers chose against relinking the First Flame, but it's likely due to their inability to control their actions in the same way Artorius was unable to do so as he stood at the gates of Ulasil, maddened by his humanity run wild due to his proximity with the Abyss. By the time we meet the Abyss Watchers, they too are confusedly fighting each other, sensing the Abyss within one another and continuing to fulfill their duties as the executive arm of the Age of Fire. It's clear too that they are still incredibly capable as it's likely due to their rebirth presence that the undead legions of Carthus are still sealed away. Our battle with the Abyss Watchers is one against a group of beings so powerful they were able to link the first flame and fight the Abyss. A force of nature that not even Gwyn could contain but the Abyss Watchers were able to make notable victories against. However, the Abyss Watchers we do meet is also a fight against a version of a being with its humanity run wild and a group of beings already in combat with one another. It's in this that the Abyss Watchers, though likely still one of the most capable forces in the entire timeline, and a faithful successor to Artorius himself, lose a lot of their strength as a worthy force of very high recognition. This loss of strength is further exaggerated when item descriptions tell us that a major aspect of their power known as the Wolfblood has completely run dry. And this is why the Abyss Watchers rank as the lowest in terms of the Rebirth Lords of Dark Souls 3, but still solidify their position this high on the list. Osiris, originally the ruler of one of the final bastions of the royal bloodline in the Dark Souls universe, shared the ambitions of his ancestors and funneled these ambitions through his own children. Osiris, faithful to the powers that be, saw only one means of elevating his kingdom and his direct bloodline to eternal status. Ascension through the right of kindling. It's likely Osiris waged all these efforts on his children. His firstborn Lorien, though an incredibly accomplished warrior with notable victories under his belt, such as slaying the demon prince, is never associated with having the power acquired in linking the first flame. However, undeterred, the king attempted to birth another heir that would be groomed from birth. So confident was Osiris of his newborn's destiny, he would name him after the kingdom itself. Unfortunately, Lothric the child was born crippled, so much so that he could not walk or even wear anything more than robes. It's likely as Lothric grew older, the king came closer to the realization Lothric did not bear the aptitude to link 
the first flame. For the king, there remain two more options. The first was to have another heir in the hope that they bear the power to link the first flame. But the second was to consult a higher power to materialize an heir that found greatness through different means. We learned these new means of greatness were in Dragonhood and more so the ascension to Dragonhood. And unsurprisingly, the king chose the second option. Thankfully for the king, Lothric was perched right up against the Grand Archives and the final resting place of another royal figure with lofty ambitions, Seath the Peldrake. Confining himself to the archives, Osiris would learn of Seath's quest for immortality. He would learn of a covenant of scholars who sought the ascension to dragonhood, and most importantly, would learn of the works of Big Hat Logan. As the king consulted the scholars of the archives and pushed himself into the studies of Big Hat Logan, he would, just like Logan, become obsessive over the quest for power in the shadow of Seath. It's not clear what transpired during Osiris' studies and research, but it's likely he had, much like Logan and Seath, become consumed by the crystals at the heart of the archives, and somewhere down the line he either had a child named Ocelot that bare the power of the dragons, or maddeningly imagined its existence, fulfilling his wishes for an heir fit for the throne of fire. In this research he would begin to transform and began taking on the appearance of a humanoid Seath, partially fulfilling his original goal. However, it's clear by the time we meet him, Ocelot is no more and he is left deformed and maddened. In assessing Osiris' strength, there is a lot of credit granted to him through item descriptions, indicating he was a great force. The dragon scale ring tells us many assassins were dispatched to his domain, but none returned. The consumed king ascribed his resilience to the divine protection of the dragon scale. In this, we learn not only was he able to fend off against countless assassins likely commissioned on a large bounty, but also he did so through successfully integrating dragon scales in into his repertoire. Scales, we learn, were built to be virtually indestructible. When we look at the item descriptions of the White Dragon Breath and Moonlight Greatsword, we also learn Osiris was successfully about to mimic some of the power Big Hat Logan had initially conjured. Something that is so immense that both schools and apprentices based on his achievements not only exist in this timeline eons later, but also had an incredible amount of influence. It's likely that Osiris came even closer to Seath than Big Hat Logan did. When equating his association with the Moonlight Greatsword, his physical being, and even the spells he was able to conjure. However, However, the one factor that stops Osiris from being one of the most powerful beings in the game is that he, much like Seath and Logan, were plagued with one of the greatest debuffs in the entire game, the Curse of Madness, perpetuated by the knowledge of crystal sorcery and Seath's research. In this, though Osiris held powers to likely command legendary status, built on the shoulders of Big Hat Logan and even the Peldrake himself, his inability to reconcile with reality hinders him greatly, ultimately solidifying his position here on the list. The next entry is yet another thematic continuation of the story of Crystals and of course, Big Hat Logan. In my video on ranking bosses in Dark Souls 1, one of my biggest pet peeves were my inability to rank Big Hat Logan, as he would never show up as a boss and therefore disqualified him from all the criteria of that video. But thankfully in Dark Souls 3, Big Hat Logan's influence is carried on by his spiritual successors in the form of the Crystal Sages. The Crystal Sage's story starts at the heart of the main timeline. Referred to as the Preacher Twins, the Crystal Sage's early years shared many similarities to that of Logan's. Having excelled faster than most of their peers, they became incredibly efficient in the art of sorcery and had excelled in the pinnacle of crystal sorcery even before arriving in Lothric. It's likely they were referred to as preachers as once they had arrived in Lothric, likely looking for the Grand Archives, they preached Logan's teachings and are wholly responsible for re-embedding his knowledge into the Archives as a whole. This would allow both the twins to rise to the zenith of the Archives bureaucracy and solidify their position as the head of the institution. Taking on their new titles as the Crystal Sages, they reinvigorated the school by teaching them the technique known as head waxing, which was a form of repellent against the maddening of Seath's research, therefore allowing the scholars to dive deeper into their studies without going insane, a practice that was largely successful as even by the time that we meet the Sages, it appears they too have retained their sanity. 
Eventually the twins would part and one of the twins would remain at their post in the Grand Archives to assist the now desperate King of Lothric in his research into Seath and Dragonhood, likely being the main force that facilitated Osiris's transformation and ability to utilise crystal sorcery. The other twin however would go off and join the Undead Legion of Farron, identifying with the cause of the Undead Legion and even erecting a new school of magic that utilised sorcery and traditional forms of swordsmanship valued by the disciples of Artorius. This twin would even go on to teach prominent figures such as Hazel in this new form of sorcery and it would be attributed to the wide-ranging success of the Covenant in attaining their contemporary goals. The twins likely harboured equal strength as both their feats were notably exceptional. One was able to harness Seath in Osiris, the other was able to utilise crystal sorcery and manipulate it to a whole new art of war. For this video, we are zeroing in on just one of the twins, the twin that would join the Undead Legion as this is the one that appears as a boss. The reason why the Crystal Sages rank higher than even Osiris who was a man who was able to manifest Seath is that the Sage was able to retain his sanity alongside the fact that he was likely more skilled in crystal sorcery than even the later Osiris on the merit of item descriptions indicating the Crystal Sages reached the level of Big Hat Logan better than any other being to ever exist and even stood on his shoulders in developing beyond Logan's research. There is an obvious argument to be made that Osiris became more powerful than the Crystal Sages, but on the back of his obviously crippling insanity and the likelihood Osiris learned his sorcery from the Crystal Sages, I'm happy to write this off for the video. When we face off against the Crystal Sage of Farron, we are not only facing off against what is likely a man who harboured Logan better than anyone else, but also a man who built the blueprint and utilised the modern form of warfare that outlived his own existence and invigorated an institution of orthodoxy orthodox warriors into adopting a school of mages, a feat that has been unheard of throughout the series. We have spoken much already about the Outrider Knights and the influence of the Pontiff in the world of Dark Souls. The Pontiff alone holds more accolades of strength in this game than anyone else, with influence over the trajectory of the main storyline, to the subjugation of a literal god and the elevation of an underground covenant to a place of mainstream prominence. All this was not done alone, however. The Pontiff stood tall, but beside him were his Outrider Knights, beings bound by his influence through the rings resembling his eyes, testament to his omnipresence, but also his constant hounding of his subjects. Many of his subjects were likely great warriors turned savage beasts, rarely named, but distinct in their prowess. However, there is one exception to this rule we hear of, the being known as the Dancer of the Boreal Valley. One of the Pontiff's greatest achievements was his domination over Gwyndolin, a direct descendant of Gwyn and likely one of two last living heirs of Gwyn himself. It's likely, however, in this campaign of dominance, he came across many other spoils as he appropriated an Orlando. His prized plunder, however, as per the description of the soul of the dancer and the dancer's crown, was likely a princess and distant heir of Gwyn himself. This heir, of course, was the Dancer. Though unnamed, we are given constant clues to her royal lineage, with the Dancer's crown suggesting the mask was made only for direct descendants of the old royal family. Exactly whose child this was was unclear, and it's not worth debating, as what is important here is that she is indeed an heir of one of the greatest forces, if not the greatest force, in the Dark Souls timeline. The princess, a dancer by profession, would catch the allure of the pontiff, and according to the soul of the dancer, this distant daughter of the formal royal family was first ordered to dance, but would soon be recruited as an outrider knight to help the pontiff further exert his influence. Bestowed with a double slashing sword and one of the pontiff's rings of influence, she would be condemned to the service of the pontiff and in turn to his corrupting ire. Now to the important part, what do we know about how powerful the dancer is at the time that we meet her? Thankfully the power of the dancer is one of the most transparent readings in Dark Souls 3. 
The first to note is that much like Vought, it's likely the Dancer was the most elite of the Outrider Knights. And when we hearken back to the previous comments on how the Outrider Knights were integral to the power of the Pontiff, this really contextualizes the true extent of power this position deserves. Secondly, the Dancer deserves recognition too as a member of Gwyn's ruling order. We learn from Dark Souls 1 that beings descended from Gwyn commanded the heights of power and influence throughout the land, with examples of Gwyndolin single-handedly holding down the entirety of Anolondo through continent-wide illusions and influence. Thirdly, the Dancer is given further distinction as a member of the Outrider Knights as it's the only instance where the Pontiff himself granted enchanted weaponry to his subjects. The Dancer's enchanted swords tell us paired enchanted swords that Pontiff Sullivan bestowed upon the Dancer of the Boreal Valley. These blades symbolic of the Dancer's vows are enchanted with dark magic in the right hand and fire in the left, mirroring the Pontiff. It's the section about mirroring the pontiff that really echoes the power the dancer was able to command. As the pontiff harbored both the power of the profaned flame, deep sorcery and lunar spells to fight and it's likely the dancer too held such a diverse exertion of power. Finally, and likely my favourite, is that the Dancer is able to utilise her formal profession in her fighting ability. From gameplay cues, we learn that the Dancer fights rhythmically, echoing movement and swipes in a pattern reminiscent of a set-piece dance, further contextualising her diversity in combat. The Dancer is a true combination of many things of old gods, the power of the revolutionary tide that is the Pontiff, and the most elite class of knights that are so influential in the entire land. The next entry is a great one as it ties together so much of Dark Souls' story regarding the royal bloodline and even the lasting remnants of the Bed of Chaos. Before we even meet the Demon Princes, we are given an idea of what to expect as a major aspect of the lore is underpinned by Lothric and Lorien, another set of princes. Although we'll go into more detail on Lorien soon, what we do need to gather from this is that Lorien is explicitly told to us to have already faced off against a certain Demon Prince and with great effort bested the beast which solidified his title as the most capable knight in Lothric. It's under these achievements that the kingdom and even Prince Lothric would look towards Lorien as a saving grace in the right of kindling, as Lothric, though purposed from birth to link the first flame, was severely crippled and unable to make the pilgrimage. Lorien's achievements noted to be plenty are exaggerated mostly by his triumph over the demon prince and the glory of which would predicate him as a worthy candidate to link the first flame in lieu of Lothric. However, Lorien and Lothric would have such a close relationship, Lorien's intention to leave Lothric behind was never formalised. Instead, they chose to bear each other's gifts and curses as one and take the form of the twin princes, being explicitly capable of linking the first flame, a story that gets more complicated complicated once we picture in the scholars and even Sullivan, but that's for later. What we do need to learn here is that the demon prince that Lorien fought was grand enough that it was a turning point in how the world understood Lorien's power. In this, we can assume the demon prince was always held as an incredibly capable force in the world. But if Lorien killed the Demon Prince, why do we fight another set of Demon Princes in the Ringed City? It's more likely that Lorien did not entirely destroy the Demon Prince, but rather subdued him to the point he fell to the bottom of the Ringed City. We get a better picture of this as we reach the bottom ourselves and we are faced with two peculiar demons. One named Demon from Below and the other named Demon in Pain. We can easily assume from his name and descriptions that the demon from below was not forced below but rather originated from these grounds, and therefore we can reasonably assume he is not the demon prince that Lorien slew. But the demon in pain, on the other hand, shows many indicators it is precisely the demon that Lorien was able to cast to the pit of the world, as from its appearance and name, it's clear the demon has previously been decimated with a torn body and tattered wings. 
If we are able to kill the demons, one of the two will formally be announced to us again as the Demon Prince. This is likely mirroring the inherent parallels between Lorien and Lothric and the Demon in Pain and from below, as their souls seem inherently intertwined and build on each other as a final vestment of the Bed of Chaos struggling, as it always has, for a place in the world. So in terms of strength, there is one benchmark I want to get formally clear. The demon in pain who Lorien bested is not likely at the same capacity it was during the fight against Lorien. His fall and beaten appearance are dead giveaways for that. However, with the knowledge that the demon in pain would find the demon from below in the ring city and in its crippled state, much like Lothric fused his soul with his kin, means his strength level despite his previous injuries is once again elevated. We know the demon from below is likely to a close relative to the Bed of Chaos, due to his ability to conjure very primal versions of the Bed of Chaos's pyromancy. It's likely too that the demon from below is a first generation demon. His appearance would even explain the descendants of the Batwing demons that later populate the world. Due to the nature of the Bed of Chaos being a dwindling force, being a first generation demon alone brings it a high level of credit in terms of power. We can also assume the soul of the two demons being brought to one has combined the lasting power of the demon in pain with the demon from below. And if we're able to draw back the parallels with Lothric and Lorien, this fusion likely encompasses a strength much greater to what we could have expected from the former singular demon prince that Lorien had fought. With the above being said, the main question on this list is where do we find the demons in terms of strength regarding this list, and more specifically in relation to Lothric and Lorien. In truth, Lothric and Lorien have a much greater narrative context as to the capability of their strength, something that is told to us various times as being incredibly capable of linking the first flame in this age, so much so that the world watched with bated breath hoping they would take the call. We also know the bed of chaos that the demon princes source their energy from has all but dwindled due to the countless conflicts through the ages, especially in relation to the devastation the Ivory King was able to sustain against it in the second installment of the game. It's for these reasons that the demon princes rank below Lothric and Lorien, but the stark lore-related parallels don't keep them too far apart at all. This next entry lets us follow the story of a being not too dissimilar to ourselves. Sister Frida's story begins not too long before our own, but before we go into more detail about her story, it's important we knew where she came from and what her goals in life were, as these hold crucial clues as to her overall strength. Londor was a section of the world inspired by the actions of Karth from the first installment of the game. I go into a lot more detail about this topic in my video titled In Search of the Dark Soul, but the gist here is that Londor were the remnants of beings either directly involved or inspired by the rebellion of the Four Kings. In this they held the unique ability of life drain, something gifted to them by Karth himself. It's said to us that Life Drain was such a potent power that Gwyn, even at his peak, feared the consequences of such a power and of course, as Karth and the story of the Four Kings tell us, the origins of this power and the nature of its existence were inherently tied to the Dark Soul and the campaign of humanity against Gwyn's oppressive subversion of nature. Gwyn, fearing this, attempted to bury the entirety of the home of the Four Kings named New Londo. However, the raw humanity of the Agents of the Dark are not so easily dismissed, as many of the followers of New Londo would make it out alive, specifically the Covenant of Men known as the Dark Wraiths, Agents of Karth and the Four Kings. The Dark Wraiths appear through the timeline as a force against the Agents of Fire, consistently combating them in every installment of the series and being the Abyss's attempt at a monopoly of power. After a prolonged conflict, much of these Agents of Dark would settle in a land known as Londor, a place where hollows and all things derived from humanity had a safe haven, a place to learn, to research and most importantly, to influence the world. We can actually play out a certain ending that in many ways is an alternative end to the entire game, where we become intertwined with Londor and the Sable Church that governed the body, ultimately bringing together the aspects of Manus through the Dark Sigils and using this to conquer the land of the Lords and bury the first flame in a darkening hue. 
The permanence of this ending is debatable, but it definitely is a distinctly new ending we never see in a game that is so familiar with regular and inevitable cycles. However, before our campaign for Londor that triggers this ending, we also learn of another chosen undead and likely resident of Londor who commission themselves in the same fashion we do, fighting off the lofty hurdles of gaining an audience with the soul of Cinder, but ultimately falling short at the final hurdle. This chosen undead was Sister Frida, and one of the three sisters that headed the Sable Church. In this, we learn that Sister Frida was clearly unable to muster the power to overcome the soul of Cinder, and therefore clearly not powerful enough, either in soul or capacity, to triumph as a new chosen undead. It would be easy to just assess Frida's strength here as one that falls below that of the soul of Cinder, but remember, even our playable character as an Ashen One once failed to link the first flame as a chosen undead, but ultimately we do eventually overcome this challenge in the final installment. By the time we meet Frida, she is, much like us, brought back to Earth due to the belt tolling in the absence of the Inheritor of the Flame. However, unlike us, Frida is completely apathetic to her original mission, and instead finds a home in a place where those who have lost meaning can find peace. This place, of course, is Ariandel. Ariandel, however, is of course a parallel microcosm of the original world, but in this world, the first flame's darkening and hollowing is represented by rot and decay instead, and the fire that would naturally overcome the rot represented the dark soul. But Frida, instead of positioning herself as the radical she once was in the original world, looks to instead do the complete opposite in Ariandel. In this, she acts as Gwyn had in the Age of Fire and finds her way to convince Father Ariandel, who oversaw the land, against allowing the nature to take form and to subdue the revolutionary forces of fire by sacrificing his own blood to quell the fire and allow the stagnation to continue. A very similar premise to Gwyn asking humans to continue giving away their souls to the right of linking the first flame to allow for the the age of fire to continue even if the world was slowly being consumed by ash. It's clear by the time we meet Frida, she has embedded herself well within the world, even learning the native art of frost sorcery. But this isn't the only aspect of the boss battle with Frida that we can attribute to her being more stronger than her original form that failed to link the first flame. We also learn she has become more closely affiliated with the strength of Father Ariandel, and the fight itself requires the chosen undead to face two bosses at once. Father Ariandel's strength is never spoken of, and in the manner that it is, he often is spoken of as a benevolent figure who continues to sacrifice all manners of himself in the preservation of the world. Nothing is spoken of of his power, but it's clear it's powerful enough to embellish Frida with an aspect of rebirth at his own sacrifice, mirroring his flaying that continues to preserve the world of Ariandel in its current state. From this, we can reasonably assume the synergy we encounter the two call for a greater understanding of Frida's strength as somewhat more powerful than she was at the time that she lost to the soul of Cinder. However, nothing is spoken of in relation to her newfound strength being capable enough to yet overcome her previous shortcomings, and I do not feel it is reasonable to assume that she is capable of doing so in her current form, as Dark Souls 3 is not shy about overly assessing the power of a being in relation to their capacity to link the first flame. For for this reason, Sister Frida, though one of the greatest challenges gameplay-wise, falls short of the clear benchmark that is the Soul of Cinder and places here on the list. The story of the Soul of Cinder is not necessarily a difficult one to go through. There aren't any specific points of lore or aspects of its origins that are notable in the same sense as some of the other entries on this list. But what is important to remember about the Soul of Cinder is why it exists in the land of Dark Souls 3. The actions of Lothric's dismissal of the rite of linking the first flame would leave the world in a place of somewhat limbo. This stage of limbo further enforced by beings such as Sullivan and the increased influence of the agents of Londor meant the current cycle was notably the longest and bleakest for the agents of fire. 
In desperation and an act of lordly intervention, bells were tolled and the world was given a final push for a chosen undead to reperform the rite of linking the first flame. First, the three previous lords of Cinder are born, something that proved ineffective as they had become apathetic with the ritual in totality. But in a further act of divine intervention, the bell is tolled again and the ashen ones are rebirthed. The chosen undeads, who had previously failed to link the first flame, were finally given a second chance. During this period, something peculiar was happening at the kiln of the first flame. As in most cases, the first flame is defended by a previous inheritor or agents of the previous lord. In Dark Souls 3, however, what defends the first flame is not just the previous inheritor, but the total amalgamation of every chosen undead before it, and even holds an aspect of Gwyn entirely reminiscent of the one we meet at the end of the first installment. As the Soul of Cinder is essentially a power check for any chosen undead, it's easy to assume the Soul of Cinder's strength is totally benchmarked and limited by entries who are told to us to have the ability to have either previously linked the first flame or have the capacity to do so in contemporary times. However, there is another theory suggesting the Soul of Cinder is not just the usual caliber of being that lays as the final challenge for any chosen undead budding enough to take on the ritual, for in this installment of the series, the Age of Fire is not just being threatened at a usual level but at its highest degree. With the rise of Londor, the influence of Sullivan, the prolonged timeline of the fading of fire, the burnt out nature of the world, the age of fire itself has fallen under a threat never seen before and the soul of Cinder is likely not just the final challenge for any chosen undead but also the final defense mechanism for the age of fire in totality. In this, the Soul of Cinder is likely a much greater, maybe even the greatest benchmark for any chosen undead who has ever seeked the first flame. In practicality, this unique distinction is fulfilled by manifesting every chosen undead who'd linked the fire before it. The Soul of Cinder has the unique capacity to call forth all major forms of combat through the series, from unique aspects of the protagonist from Dark Souls 1 with the Darkwood Grain Ring, to spells first introduced in Dark Souls 2, to fighting styles only accessible in Dark Souls 3, and of course, most notable of its distinctions is the Soul of Cinder's ability to manifest the entire entire moveset of Gwyn, including the direct use of sunlight. It's for this reason the Soul of Cinder sits not just as a benchmark for the chosen undeads of old, but a distinctly challenging task for any chosen undead even in contemporary times. Something we see evidenced in the cinematic of the Soul of Cinder burying many chosen undead as they failed to do what Lothric was supposed to. And of course one of those being buried was the extremely capable Sister Frida, which really contextualizes the strength of the Soul of Cinder. Due to the nature of the Soul of Cinder being a power check, there are various item descriptions in relation to other bosses that actually give us direct comparative knowledge on strength. I therefore have to concede that if there is a boss who is told to us to be able to successfully link the first flame in the current age, they too would also be able to defeat the Soul of Cinder canonically. Examples of this of course are the Twin Princes, but there are others too, which actually leads us perfectly to our next spot on the list. A lot of the story regarding Champion Gundir has already been covered in the previous listing for Ayudex Gundir. For this reason, I'll gloss over his origin story and go straight into why Champion Gundir ranks higher than Ayudex Gundir on this list. Simply put, the version of Gundir that would be the judge in the main timeline has suffered both impalement and restriction as stated in the item description of his soul and prisoner's chain. The version we meet much earlier on, however, is one that is in full capacity of a being who is most likely capable of overcoming the challenges required to link the first flame. However, ranking Champion Gundir above those who have already linked the first flame or beings such as Lothric and Lorien feels dishonest as there is no concrete milestone Gundir was able to achieve in his lifetime, just very explicit mentionings of what he could have achieved. But this is not to diminish much of his acclaim to strength, as whatever land or authority Gundir came from, he is mentioned to be the most capable of their warriors and even fashioned himself on the king of that land, commanding a degree of authority amongst military personnel reserved only for the most capable soldier. 
In this, we can very well assume Gundir was an incredibly talented warrior, enough so that even on his failure to overcome the first hurdle of the challenge due to a timely error, he was described as powerful enough to explicitly overcome all the hurdles to linking the first flame, and powerful enough that the authority of the land saw it fit to refashion his role as a benchmark for any chosen undead worthy to link the first flame, much like Gwyn had done with the chosen undead of the Undead Asylum. It's on this merit Gundir donned with heavy armour, an incredibly agile skill set and a halberd built specifically for him as an eternal aspect of his service ranks here on the list, limited to a step above the soul of Cinder due to his unmaterialised potential. An aspect of Dark Souls outside the main narrative of the game that sees subtle development through the series is the story of giants. Giants are known to us as beings that are not human, therefore unbearing of humanity, and not gods. So where they sit in relation to the primary dialectic of the world will remain a mystery. What we do know about the giants is that through history their relationship with the order of the world has come in two forms, either as subjects that sought to be conquered or a tool sought to be used as a means to an end. There is a severe lack of empathy given to giants throughout the entire series and the trilogy, specifically in the events of Dark Souls 2, as Vendrick's campaign was nothing more than an imperialist war against an unsuspecting race. Similar to the everlasting dragons, the giants would consistently put up a fight, but ultimately fall short throughout history, and their descendants taking on various forms would end up scattered throughout the world, from weapons of war for the gods to experiment fodder for humans. In Dark Souls 3, however, there is a giant that superseded this expectation. For Yorm would not only become a ruler of a domain of men, but also bear the ancestry of a certain giant lord that was once subjugated by the very race that would embrace him. It's very likely Yorm's ancestor was the giant lord from the second instalment of the series. The description of his ancestor as a conqueror, alongside the severe thematic connections between the profaned capital and Dark Souls 2, draw the connection quite clearly. Coming from what is likely the most powerful section of the giant's lineage, Yorm's strength would find admiration from the humans of the profaned capital. Albeit, admiration of his strength rather than his race, for the people of the profaned capital, as per many item descriptions, held reservations to his kind, and even held his position of authority in a manner insincere of a ruler who provided unbridled protection and empathy to his subjects. Yorm would pay little mind to it, however, and carried on with his duties regardless of the obvious bigotry. In terms of strength during this period, Yorm's power can be assessed in two forms. The first is that he was such a powerful being that his power would become his influence, and even the race of men who once shunned his race and proclaimed a near genocide of his kind could do nothing but respect him regardless of their antagonisms, and even ask for his aid and leadership, a triumph unseen in the entire trilogy. But secondly, and more importantly, Yorm knew how powerful he was. So powerful that he knew the only true strength that could reliably bring him down would be the monumental force of storms. And in this, Yorm would, in all his sincerity and as a plea to his people to grant them assurance of his intentions, give away a weapon that contained the power of storms. Power to bring Yorm to his knees at a single command. Soon enough, Yorm's rule would coincide with the fading of the first flame, and the world would be awaiting another chosen undead to link the fire. However, for the people of the profaned capital, the issue was twofold, as at the heart of the profaned capital were the remnants of a power so antithetical to the Age of Fire that it harboured both the aspects of the Bed of Chaos and even the darkness of the Abyss. We'll go into more detail about this for Pontiff Sullivan's placement as I'll go deeper into the lore of the profaned flame, but what we need to know here is that the fading of the flame only empowered this unstable force and the profaned flame would begin warping his subjects into abominations reminiscent of the Abyss, and even Manus. 
In this, the dwindling flames of the Age of Fire would affect his people dramatically, and Yorm would in due time be pleaded with to link the first flame, something he, as a self-imposed servant of his people, would do so. However, this is the first time a giant had ever linked the first flame, and in a cruel twist of fate, the ritual usually reserved for humans would bear disastrous effects, enraging the profaned flame further and exclusively burning every human in his kingdom, as is the nature of a flame so closely linked to humanity and the abyss. When we meet Yorm, he is resurrected from his grave, sitting atop his charred throne amongst the victims of his actions. Yorm here likely bears much of the strength he held before linking the first flame. The fight itself is likely a much greater endeavour than even the fight with the previous Lord of Cinder already on this list in the form of the Abyss Watchers, as he suffers no notable handicaps except for one, a self-imposed one. For the power of storms is something that lays at the foot of his chamber and in the hands of a former subject and dear friend of his that survived the capital's destruction. In terms of ranking Yorm, we can take two different approaches. We can assume for the first approach, we have decided to take a hold of the Storm Ruler in our battle against him, which in many ways trivializes our fight, as the weapon was specifically crafted by Yorm himself as a means to bring him down even during his peak. The other approach, which is the type I'm actually going to take for comparative reasons, is a fight with Yorm without the aid of the Storm Ruler. This premise actually helps us rank him against other bosses and it's the main reason I'm using this approach for this list. Using this approach, let's list some of the main reasons why Yorm ranks as high as he does. For one, he is the descendant of a subsection of giants that were likely the most capable of their race as per the description of his ancestry. We also know that Yorm was so powerful he may even supersede his own ancestors and found a unique admiration from the very beings that once subjugated his kind. Furthermore, Yorm was so convinced that no human could bring him down that he chose to grant his people a self-destruct button to assure accountability. And of course, as is the case for all resurrected lords, he holds the power to link the first flame, a benchmark that automatically grants him a high position on this list. It's for these reasons Yorm places as a stronger entity than his more directly comparable counterparts in that of the Abyss Watchers, but also takes a higher position than entities such as Champion Gundir on the merit that Yorm had more to his name than just the capability to link the first flame. Born into what is likely a clerical environment, Aldrich's past remains mysterious and intentionally ambiguous. What is clear though, is that through his time, he would become revered as a faithful agent of the Way of the White, attaining such esteem that he would reach sainthood, a position held for the most faithful. It's unknown as to when Aldrich would reach sainthood. Was this before the construction of the Church of the Deep or after? It's unclear. What is clear though, is that Aldrich would be one of the first clerics tasked with watching over the Deep, a front line against the seemingly unknown force. During Aldrich's time, it's likely the Church of the Deep was still associated closely with the Way of the White, and the distinct philosophy of the Deep that would epitomise it in the world of Dark Souls only materialised upon Archdeacon MacDonald's influence after Aldrich had already taken the mantle of the Lord of Cinder. At the time Aldrich was initially tasked to look over the deep, the force that governed the mysterious entity remained a mystery, but it was clear it was having a profound effect on those that looked over it. In time, as Aldrich kept such a close proximity to the area, he would begin to change and hunger for human flesh would consume him. Though abhorrent in nature, the way of the white and subsequently the ruling family of the Age of Fire were not entirely averse to his cannibalistic tendencies, as in the past with knights such as Smaug, the ruling family utilised cannibalistic beings as a utility for the state. In the same breath, Aldrich's hunger would be fed and beings likely criminals and undead would be sent to Aldrich as a form of punishment or disposal. 
It's likely as Aldrich began his campaign of consumption, it coincided with the rise of the undead plague. Therefore, the amounts of beings that were being consumed were enormous. Evidence of the sheer extent of Aldrich's victims can be seen throughout the game with thousands of graves piled up just on the road to the Church of the Deep. The ruling order would even commission beings to gather corpses to bring to Aldrich en masse. A unique aspect of Aldrich's consumption was his ability to retain the souls of the beings he was consuming, not only enlarging him, but also gifting him their own strength. Eventually, Aldrich would grow so large and powerful that the Church of the Deep would be instructed by their then ruling bureaucracy in the form of the Way of the White and the ruling family of Anorlando to have Aldrich link the first flame. In this, Aldrich would be led to the the first flame and he would indeed succeed as a formal successor to the first flame. Aldrich's story, however, does not end here, as once the bells of awakening were tolled due to Lothric's resignation from the ritual of linking the first flame, the old saint was reborn. However, much had changed since the last time he was alive, as the Church of the Deep from the influence of Sullivan and the Archdeacons had changed significantly, and had broken away from the way of the white under the new leadership of Pontiff Sullivan. Aldrich, disillusioned with the throne, did not see any motivation to relink the first flame, and instead lent an ear to the Archdeacons and Sullivan, learning of the new philosophy of the deep, prophecies of a world that did not require a stagnating, unending cycle, instead boasted a new world, a place where the peace of the deep would encapsulate all the land. In the item description of Aldrich's cinders, we are told that Aldrich, likely convinced by the deacons of the deep and Sullivan, became emboldened by this new philosophy and was given the purpose, likely from Sullivan, to consume the lords and act as a vessel to usher in an age of the deep. Sullivan would shepherd the lord of cinder to the now dominated Anolondo and offer the direct descendant of Gwyn in the form of Gwendolyn as his first act in his plan to use Aldrich to create a new world. Aldrich, harbouring the ability to retain the knowledge, strength and the souls of the beings he consumed, would go on to consume Gwendolyn and become a perfect vehicle for Sullivan's grand plan. And it's in this state that we meet Aldrich, on the cusp of having consumed Gwendolyn, bearing the hallmarks of the old lord and the gravitas of all those he had consumed before. When assessing Aldrich's position, there are various notable factors that agree him to being the most capable Lord of Cinder. Firstly, he is the only Lord of Cinder that was chosen not on the ambitions of his own, but the sheer extent of his power, a being so overwhelmingly strong that the ruling factions of Dark Souls unanimously decided to bring him to the First Flame, assured he would be powerful enough to retain the Cycle of Fire. Secondly, when we combine the knowledge that Aldrich grew more powerful on the consumption of other humans, alongside the sheer extent of humans he had consumed evidenced by the Road of Sacrifice, it's not difficult to assume Aldrich's power and combined knowledge was immense. Context of this strength can be seen twofold. Firstly, it's likely he was able to manifest the image of Nito on the merit of his consumption of undead. The fact that the blade at the end of his sword is the Gravelord's sword is further testament to this. Secondly, upon resurrection, his ability to consume and correctly summon upon the image of Gwendolyn demonstrate Aldrich's power via consumption is boundless, and the version of him that we face off against is likely even more powerful than the one that would go on to link the first flame in the original timeline, a testament that cannot be made for the previous Lords of Cinder. In this, Aldrich affirms himself the position as the strongest Lord of Cinders that we face off against in Dark Souls 3. In assessing what makes the Twin Princes such a formidable battle, even in comparison to the other chosen undeads who would actually go on to link the first flame, is a twofold task. Literally, as the Twin Princes Lorien and Lothric are, when we meet them, conjoined. Conjoined at the soul, conjoined physically, and conjoined in spirit. So as we learn more about their overall strength, we must first use the understanding of each individual prince and then what in totality is to be said for their contemporary form as a single entity. 
The story of the twin princes is contextualised around one brother, Lothric, named after the kingdom of his father, Osiris, who ruled over the domain. As discussed earlier, Osiris is best known for his ambitions, but also his failure. In his eyes, his greatest failure was the birth of what he would aspire to be the new chosen one to link the fire. So much was Osiris's conviction he would name the child to bear this task after the kingdom itself, Lothric. To his grief, Lothric was born frail, unbefitting of even the blade that would be crafted in the lofty aspirations. But in Lothric's shadow was Lorien, the elder brother, likely Osiris's firstborn, and ironically, Lorien was in many ways the capable brother, so capable that in his life he is explicitly noted to be not only the most capable knight of the domain, but one that had bested even the demon prince, as stated in the description of Lorien's greatsword. Lorien, however, did not harbour any animosity to the favouritism his frail sibling was given. Instead, he stood side by side with him throughout his entire life. There isn't any narrative on what life was like between the siblings prior to becoming one entity, but it's easy to deduce that Lorien loved his brother, and chose to conjoin willingly, and understood that the conjoining of their souls would lead to him sharing many of the defects with his younger brother. Lothric's strength as an individual perhaps is the most difficult and subjective part of this, as it's clear through the context of his platinum sword that he was able to utilise powerful faith-based spells, but unlike Lorien, no achievement is given here to indicate context. Many in the community argue that Lothric, independent of his brother, still harboured great strength, and I think I find myself somewhere in the middle, as it's clear he did bear some of those inherent strengths brought down from his royal lineage, but we have to acknowledge this was significantly stifled by his birth defects. So much so, he alone was not fit for the rite of kindling, or even capable of wearing any more than the light robes he was given as omniment. As their father, Osiris, exiled himself looking for a means to bear a new child to inherit the first flame, Lorien, the elder sibling, chose to forfeit his own soul to conjoin with his brother to come as one. One that was by all estimations in the game able to link the first flame. In doing so, they became the twin princes. On the precipice of this ritual, however, the scholars of the Grand Archives that advised the twin princes in the king's absence shared knowledge about the first flame, the cycle and its inherent nihilism. This would fall on listening ears and the siblings, now twins, would abandon their birthright and instead lay dormant in Lothric, awaiting the fading of the fire. So how powerful were they as twins? The first easy judgement to make here is that the twin princes are likely much more powerful than each of their respective previous forms. As it's indicated, neither Lorien or Lothric alone were able to link the fire on their own, but as twins, they were, suggesting their twinhood made them considerably more powerful. When we equate what we know of Lorien's strength alongside what we know of Lothric's strength when coupled with a capable body, when looking at the twin princes in their conjoined form, we are not only looking at the power of Lorien, but also a full capacity Lothric. Their synergy alone dwarfs the power of most other entities in the world, and it's no wonder why the pontiff chose not to battle the princes head on and instead encircled the kingdom in a permanent stalemate instead. Dead. If we then embellish this with the knowledge that the twin princes are told to us in detail to have harboured the power to link the first flame, we can accurately assume their strength by that definition outmatched that of the soul of Cinder. Combining the power of Lorien, the slayer of one of the greatest final standing bastions of the Bed of Chaos, alongside a now abled bodied Lothric brought to his zenith via twinhood, the Twin Princes rank this high on the list with ease. Throughout the entire game, even from the first passage of narration we are given in the first instalment of the series, we are introduced to a distinctly legendary race of beings. We are told this race of beings is the bedrock of the world that we play in. It's the premise 
for the age we live through, and even the major plot point for the entirety of the second instalment. But as much as we're told of their existence, as much as we're given imagery totems and stories, we only ever meet one of their kind, one that was unlike the others. This is of course in the form of Seed the Scaleless, and of course we're talking about the legendary everlasting dragons. Beings told to be so monumental that the prime forces of every lord, even the furtive pygmy, had to combine their strength to bring them down and lay the foundations of their future on their corpses. The way the mythos of the everlasting dragons is told to us through the entire game is one of my favourite forms of world building in any game. Speaking on their strength as godly tales fit for the pantheon of Greek gods, we are never actually granted a true look and feel of facing off against one of these everlasting dragons in their original capacity though. Yes, we fight Seath who is explicitly an everlasting dragon, but he suffers defects that took away the most important characteristic to what makes the everlasting dragons so unique. And yes, we do fight the so-called ancient dragon in Dark Souls 2, but this being is, as per my last video on the matter, nothing more than a careful imitation born on the soul of giants, not dragons. But Dark Souls 3 does something special for us however. In the final instalment of the game, at the literal end of the world hidden deep below, we are finally given the opportunity to face what is likely the closest being to the original concept of everlasting dragons in the form of Dark Eater, Medir. The Old Moonlight, which is a sorcery we get from defeating Medir, tells us that the sword is named after Moonlight, but it's different than the one fashioned off the Pale Drake Seath. Perhaps it's rooted in an older memory from not long after the beginning. This alone tells us Dark Eater Medir is not just a descendant of the Everlasting Dragons, but a being of the same origins as Seath, a being that existed at the beginning of the world. Medir is an everlasting dragon. For the first time, we are able to speak truly of a living everlasting dragon, scales and all. Medir's story likely was the same as the story of his ancestors, but to truly understand what this means, we have to understand everlasting dragons as more than just a physical being, but also as a concept. So bear with me while I put my master's degree in philosophy to good use for the first time in a long time. Everlasting dragons are timeless in the sense they did not have a beginning for they were the beginning, the thesis of a world that allowed for the antithesis to have a meaning through a dialectical relationship. I'm not going to bore you with the philosophical concepts of materialism and dialectics, but what is important to know is that we only understand light as light due to the absence of dark. In the same sense, everlasting dragons and their relationship with the rising lords in the same breath gave us an understanding of life due to their dialectical or juxtaposing relationship with a force that conceptualised life. The lords taught the world what it's like to be alive and the previous everlasting state of the ancient dragons were no longer everlasting due to the introduction of such a concept. The lords were life and therefore the everlasting dragons had to die. It's no wonder the lords first actions in the world were to destroy the everlasting dragons as it was the philosophical material justification for their existence and the future they sought to build. This campaign would eventually slaughter almost every everlasting dragon and those that would survive would by nature have to encapsulate distinct characteristics that allowed for their continued existence in the world of Dark Souls. We learn that Seath survived as he lacked the scales to begin with and thus was never truly everlasting and this premise allowed him to join forces with the lords. We also learn descendants of the everlasting dragons survived due to their future lack of everlasting traits such as scales. But there is one other truly everlasting dragon that did survive too. What Medir did that allowed him to go further than his race are never elaborated on specifically. But what is likely is that Medir demonstrated such a great capacity of either force or ability to absorb the elements of the dark that the pioneer of the new world in the form of Gwyn actually gave the ancient dragon the premise for a new existence, one that served the coming kingdom of life. 
Medea in this sense would go beyond his life as an everlasting dragon and assume one of a dragon that served a kingdom predicated on life itself. This may be why his soul states him to be a descendant of the everlasting dragon while also claiming his existence to precede that of Seath. Medea's main duty in Gwyn's new world would be to suppress the elements of dark Gwyn had already sought to place preemptive efforts against. It's no illusion therefore why Gwyn would station Medea at the heart of where he bound the dark soul to the dark sign, in the ringed city. Medea in the times that we meet him in the game is aesthetically very different to what we see in the prologue regarding everlasting dragons. He is scaled sparsely and has been taken a hold by the dark now overbearing the ringed city, much like the other agents of fire that bound themselves to combating the dark, such as Artorius. However, Medea is still by all means the largest dragon we see in the entire trilogy. He's also capable of breathing fire and most distinctly beams of darkness likely harnessed through his proximity with the abyss. With this being said, what does the above tell us about Medea's strength? For one, we can easily assume Medea is the most powerful dragon we meet in the game, only contendable to Seath the Scaleless. We also learn that Medea has been manifested by the Dark, but remains faithful to his role in the kingdom, indicated by his ability to contain the darkness without losing track of his role, and even bears the ability to utilize that very darkness in his own repertoire while performing his duties. We know that Medea has remnant scales left of the everlasting dragons of his former kin. As indicated by his body, we can see shards of this throughout his entire figure. In this sense, he still holds a close affiliation with the unkillable streak his ancestors were renowned for, exaggerated further by the fact that he is still alive at the end of the world, truly encapsulating what it means to be everlasting. However, we can also assume Medea has been negatively affected by the Dark and his tenure in the kingdom, as before we even meet him as a boss battle, we are able to cripple his wings hard enough that he is at least temporarily bound to the ground. Through this, we can conclude the key findings that Medea does not only come closest in the series to the strength of an everlasting dragon, but also finds his own distinctions in his distinct darkening and merits earned through his achievements and ability to stand tall even at the precipice of the end of the world. It's for these reasons Medea in many ways represents closest as to where a true everlasting dragon ranks, and it's no illusion why it comes so close to the top of this list, truly setting a benchmark for the next entries to come. When I went over the boss list in Dark Souls 1, I mentioned how it's likely many of the bosses in this game are likely the strongest beings to ever inhabit the series. This is because they shared the closest proximity to the original Lord Souls and the primitive age of the world. As Dark Souls progresses and we go through the series, for the most part, the strongest beings are based on their relation to their primal counterparts. For example, we measure the strength of dragons and drakes on their genetical proximity to everlasting dragons as we're told with confidence that the everlasting dragons were the most powerful of the race. And similarly, when judging how powerful beings of the dark such as Ulsana and Alana are from Dark Souls 2, we measure this on their proximity to the furtive pygmy and Manus in a similar fashion as we're told explicitly the strongest entities of the dark have the closest affiliation with the abyss. The reason the primal variants are a benchmark are based on various consistent item descriptions of this relationship and also the extremely strong narrative detail we get on the overwhelming achievements of their primal counterparts. Let's take for example the furtive pygmy. The furtive pygmy is the totality of the dark soul, we know that. And we also know beings from the dark draw their power from the dark soul. Therefore, those with the closest proximity to the furtive pygmy are likely most powerful, a simple and convincing correlation for the most part. And the same can be said for other beings, including but not limited to the demons and the bed of chaos, or even the crystal sorcerers and Seath. But it's not the entire picture, as many beings that draw little to no proximity to the primal powers can still hold their own, and it's something we even see as we reach the end of even this list. However, for some, we have beings that not only have 
explicit close proximity to the primal powers, but also bear distinct achievements that raise their profile further than that of just the premise alone. We see this most of all in our next entry, The Nameless King. The story of the Nameless King takes us all the way back to the story of the first game. At the beginning of the world there were four notable beings, Nito, Isolith, Gwyn and the Furtive Pygmy. The first major act of these beings were to join forces and revolt against the Everlasting Dragons. A war we hear little about at its face, but it's something we get context through in every game. We learned that the war was indeed a prolonged conflict, something that saw heavy losses on both sides, and we are explicitly told that Isolith, Gwyn, and Nito played an incredibly influential role in this battle. But as we go through the game, we also learn that there were notable lesser beings that had near equal impact on the outcome of the war. In this, we learn of three notable knights that were renowned as dragon slayers of godly distinction. The first we hear about is Havel, the duke who wore a boldrous set of armour and claimed the tooth of a legendary dragon as a weapon as he stampeded through the War of the Ancients. We then learn of Ornstein, a knight who harnessed lightning, nimbleness and a sharp spear to decimate dragons and carry the title of Dragon Slayer and Captain of Gwyn's Knights. But if you were paying attention, we also learn of another dragon slayer so powerful he was known as the God of War. We also know he was born from Gwyn himself and described by the Great Lightning Spear Miracle as the sole inheritor of Gwyn's sunlight and true heir of Gwyn. As we progress through the first game, we uncover that he was indeed the firstborn son of Gwyn, but for unknown reasons was banished by Gwyn and etched out of history of the royal bloodline. By the time we reach Dark Souls 3, with most of the royal bloodline drawn powerless, forgotten or even imprisoned, you'd be forgiven for believing this so-called god of war and firstborn son of Gwyn has either withered away or was always just a mythological tale. But in a twist of fate, the god of war is alive, and if you're brave enough to venture into the corner of the world at the top of the largest peak, we can meet him, sharing a resemblance to his father both in attire and in power. He is bursting with lightning, singing true to his inheritance, something we likely never see in the entire timeline as the closest we get to this level of sunlight power is a dwindled Gwyn at the end of his life. And in yet another twist of fate, the god of war raging with the power of Gwyn's sunlight is also atop a dragon. A dragon that is likely a close relative of the everlasting dragons, as we learn the god of war now nameless king, who was once a dragon slayer, would ally with the ancient dragons for reasons unknown, but open for speculation. We learn that this unlikely camaraderie would find the nameless king taking kinship with a certain ancient dragon, very likely the one he rides at the point that we meet him. In this, we can assume the dragon in question is an incredibly close relative to the ancient dragons and was able to weather the continued onslaught against its kind through the strength and protection of the nameless king, something that was definitely mutual as we come to see. It's likely that this dragon may be the second closest being to ancient dragons that we get at this stage of the timeline, adding further credit to the overall power of the Nameless King. This alliance may also be the primary reason the Nameless King was expelled from the Royal Bloodline. And as we face off against the Nameless King, we are not only facing the strongest being in Gwyn's Royal Bloodline, but also the closest being we get to facing Gwyn himself, who subsequently is also supported by a legendary dragon. This battle has us facing the full brunt of sunlight, and not just the miracles recited from stories, but the origins of those stories themselves. For remember, all miracles are based on the individual's faith in the stories of Gwyn's sunlight. But we know the Nameless King was the only being noted in description to inherit the direct sunlight of Gwyn himself, the sunlight that the stories were originally derived from. It's for these reasons the Nameless King lands itself the number three spot on this list.
In understanding Sullivan's power and his position here, we must first visit his story, for it is his campaign to power. The pontiff's origins are coated in mystery, but much like all mysteries in Dark Souls, there are clues for us to decipher. The description of the snap Free spell tells us that Sullivan was born in the painted world of Oriandel. Oriandel is in many ways a microcosm universe of the main game under a plague of rot that mirrored the stagnation of the Age of Fire. According to the snap Free spell, Sullivan, a young sorcerer likely proficient in the regional spellcasting art of frost sorcery, would leave Arendelle due to reasons that are likely related to the stagnation of Arendelle and feelings of alienation caused by his lack of belonging in Arendelle, as he had become a refuge for those who had experienced loss. But as Sullivan was born native in Arendelle, he never truly did feel that loss. Eventually, he would arrive in a more familiar universe of the series. To his disappointment, however, this new world, though grander in scale, was facing the very same issue in the form of the Age of Fire. Another stagnating cycle that was turning the world to ash rather than rot, but stagnating nonetheless. Unlike Oriandel, however, Sullivan did not leave this new realm, but instead saw an opportunity to change the nature of the world. And in this, according to the profaned greatsword, grew a grand ambition to materialize this change. Much of this grand ambition was likely built on the assurance of using the profaned flame under Irithyll for power and influence. The pontiff's first task, therefore, was to harness this flame. This was something he was able to achieve by means unknown. Upon this harnessing of the profane flame, he would enrich a great sword with the profane flame and amass followers who too were able to manipulate this source of power. But what exactly was the profane flame? This question alone requires us to look back. The description of the weapon Eleonora indicates the profane flame reaches back in the past to a certain oracle. The only being in Dark Souls referred to as an oracle is Alsana, the shard of Manus that would devote herself to the containment of the old Chaos Flame. There are various other clues to indicate the profaned capital and the profaned flame tie closely to the narrative of Dark Souls 2, such as the body of Ladismith Gilligan and the Oni Slayer Great Bow. It's likely the profaned flame is therefore linked to the vestments of the old Chaos Flame and the Bed of Chaos, but it's unfair to suggest the profaned flame is just another name for the old Chaos Flame, as we learn from item descriptions that Alsana's descendants, likely originally holding back the old Chaos in Alsana's passing, would eventually create the profaned flame due to the curse the women all bared. The curse in question is likely the abyss inherent to the descendants of the Shard of Manus that would become Alsana. It is therefore more likely that the profaned flame is not just the old chaos, but the combination of the darkness of Alsana and her descendants alongside the old chaos flame. In this, the profaned flame represented the true antithesis to the Age of Fire, as the greatest historical threats to the Age of Fire were both the old chaos of Isolith and the abyss of the furtive pygmy, aspects Gwyn spent the majority of his life fighting against. It's therefore not surprising that the pontiff, allured to the idea of overcoming the cycle of the Age of Fire, found an opportunity in harnessing its inherently dual revolutionary power. In harnessing the power of the profaned flame, he amassed his first sect of followers in the form of the priestesses and jailers still tending to the profaned flame and looking to the pontiff as their new leader. With his first act completed, he sought to move on to his second, to infiltrate the heart of the Age of Fire's lasting bureaucracy. Soon, with his newly bolstered ambition, he would find his way into Anor Londo, not as a trespasser, but as a guest, and eventually as a member of the Dark Moon Covenant, one of the final bastions of influence from the Old Order of Gods.
With the immensity of his newfound strength bolstered by his pre-existing prowess as a sorcerer, he would rise the ranks of the Dark Moon Covenant and would reach its zenith, being granted a ceremonial sword that epitomizes the judgment of the moon. Little did the bureaucracy of the Dark Moon Covenant know was that Sullivan's intentions were not guided by conservative faith of the old gods. Instead, he revered change and thus fell closer to the elements of the revolutionary power of the dark. The Great Sword of Judgment tells us a ceremonial sword held in Pontiff Sullivan's left hand, representing the judgment of the moon but with magic far closer to sorcery than any existing lunar power. Its dark blue hues deeper than the darkest moon reflected Sorcerer Sullivan's true nature. In this second act, Sullivan held in his right hand the profaned flame representing the antithetical powers to overthrow the Age of Fire, and in his right hand a display of his cunningness and ability to not only outplay the strongest living deities of the Age of Fire, but also manipulate their own power against them. But it was his third act that would actualize Sullivan as not just an ambitious sorcerer from Ariandel, but a tyrant to violently steer the course of the world forever. In his third act, Sullivan would begin his campaign against the gods. During Sullivan's height as a champion for the Dark Moon Covenant, something was happening to the Covenant's figurehead. Gwendolyn was falling sick. It's unclear as to what level of influence Sullivan had to the sickening of Gwendolyn, but there are plausible theories that suggest his close proximity and influence over the deacons that oversaw the capital may be the cause of Gwendolyn's illness. Due to Sullivan's high position in the Order of the Dark Moon Knights, Sullivan built a close affiliation with the tight-knit religious order of Anolondo, and would eventually come to find himself in the company of a group of ministers who oversaw the Deep, a subtle church that looked over a sacred site that echoed aspects of the dark, absent of fire. Sullivan, with an already established affinity for the Dark as a means to usurp the Age of Fire, would build a relationship with Archdeacon MacDonald. By this point, the Archdeacon had already found an affinity for yet another revolutionary force, deep in the depths of the church. And by the time that Sullivan had come into the picture, it's likely he would become privy to MacDonald's new, unique worldview, and would collaborate with MacDonald to further the affinity for the deep into all facets of the old religious order. And in time, MacDonald would discover deep sorcery, something he would share with the other archdeacons, namely Royce, to bring a new chapter to the old way of the white, the chapter of the deep, a philosophy that eerily echoed the nature of Sullivan, a framework for a new world, one that existed absent of the Age of Fire, one that was drowned away in the waters of the abyss. And once everything lined up from his allegiance with the Archdeacons, his position in the Dark Moon Covenant, and the eventual resignation of Gwendolyn as the prime overseer of Anolondo, Sullivan did what he does best and acted precisely. Utilising his leverage, he would appoint himself the new overseer, under the title of Pontiff. The remnants of the Way of the White would willfully submit to Sullivan, likely due to MacDonald's influence, and many of the remaining heirs of Gwyn's lineage in Anolondo would subsequently flee. It's in this exile Sullivan would capture a royal princess who would become his private entertainment, and eventually also the dancer of the Boreal Valley, as mentioned earlier in this list. Sullivan would more notably too imprison Gwendolyn in his bedchamber. Bringing together his forces from the profaned flame and his established dominance over Anolondo, Pontiff Sullivan would erect his kingdom at the foot of the old royal palace and develop a command of outrider knights befit with rings that allowed his influence to take a hold and his omnipresence to remain established in the entirety of the land. It's very likely the now Pontiff Sullivan was the strongest force in the entire land, having usurped the lasting influence of Gwyn's royal lineage. With all the power required to bring an end to the Age of Fire, the Pontiff would learn of the presence of a new chosen undead. This was of course Lothric and Lorien, incredibly powerful twins set to become the new Lord of Cinder. 
the pontiff wielding some of the greatest sources of power from the profaned flame, dark moon sorcery, and even now the aspects of the deep, could have quite easily used his forces to challenge Lothric and bring the twin princes down. But Sullivan, ever so cunning, saw another method. Instead of waging war, Sullivan studied the socio-economic turmoil that had fallen to the last remaining kingdom of the old gods, and instead of sieging Lothric, carefully placed his incredibly powerful outrider knights, including Vort and the Dancer, at key points of Lothric in trapping the kingdom and guarding against the twin prince's ambition to link the first flame. Fortunately for Sullivan, by this point the twin princes had also come to the same conclusion and had already disavowed their birthright at the advice of their regional scholars. In this, Sullivan did not just harvest the mastery of the moon, fires of the profaned flame, frost sorcery and an unmatched sphere of influence. He also guaranteed the remaining opposition were deadlocked to simply watch as the flames faded. However, in an act of divine intervention, bells would toll and the premise for the entire game would begin. Four Lords of Cinder would arise as a desperate attempt to have a worthy chosen undead to reignite the first flame. However, either from the trauma of the kindling or the alienation with the never-ending cycle, none of the previous Lords of Cinder would take the call, leading to a final bell to ring to resurrect the undead who failed to link the first flame the first time round. This time, they were resurrected as Ashen Ones, beginning the entire premise of Dark Souls 3. We can therefore attribute the Pontiff's influence and power as being directly linked to why Dark Souls 3 is such a notable chapter in the history of the franchise, as this was the first time in the cycle that there has been such a notable disruption to the rigid order of the world that we've come to know, a feat directly attributable to Sullivan's immense campaign. But it didn't end there, as the pontiff ever so cunning saw yet another opportunity with the resurrection of the old Lords of Cinder, particularly the resurrection of Aldrich, a former member of the Church of the Deep, a member that retained the unique ability to consume and grow on the basis of this consumption. Sullivan would conspire with the deacons to rear Aldrich back to Anolondo to finally bring a formal end to the royal family by eating the remaining descendants, specifically Gwendolyn, and saw Aldrich as the vehicle to how he was able to blow his final strike into the heart of the Age of Fire. In this, Sullivan wanted to use Aldrich by letting him become so powerful that the philosophy of the Deep, a philosophy in direct contrast to the Age of Fire, as per the description of the Aldrich faithful item, would become materially the only option for the world. And it's at the peak of his campaign that we actually meet the Pontiff, in all his might he's standing at the doors of Anolondo, with his outrider knights forcing his presence in the world, and a literal Lord of Cinder tightly held under his own influence. Our fight with the Pontiff is by all measures one of the greatest challenges in this entire game. We are facing a man who has harnessed the power of Alsana's darkness, the vestments of the old Chaos Flame in the form of the profaned flame, the Dark Moon's lunar influence, and even the depth of the Church of the Deep, a being that was so powerful that he was able to malform a direct descendant of Gwyn's bloodline into a raving puppet. When we think about how Dark Souls 3 ended with Gale at the end of the world, it's not a difficult task to assume in another world where the Pontiff went unchallenged by our protagonist that he would bring about the end of the Age of Fire through his own means, and would find a means of merging the fabric of the Dark Soul himself through Aldrich and suffocate the fire in a sea of the deep. It's in this the Pontiff secures himself as the second greatest power, trumping even the Nameless King, as not just the master of one art, but the master of many. Powers that bear the strength to challenge even the legacy of Gwyn himself.
Throughout the list so far, there are always a bunch of people who comment either in jest or misunderstanding that the most powerful being in Dark Souls is, of course, the Chosen Undead. For who is more powerful than a being that defeats every boss in the game from Manus to Gwyn? Of course, how canonical the Chosen Undead we play in each installment is, is debatable, as in truth the Chosen Undead is the vehicle in which allows us, the player, to navigate the entirety of the game and progress its major story arcs. There is no one canonical being that has slayed every boss in the game, nor even every boss in each installment of the games, but there is someone who comes eerily close a being that existed since the dawn of man, a being that explicitly stares right back at us as a mirror image of every playable chosen undead we have ever played thus far, all the way to the literal end of the world. To understand Slave Knight Gale as the most powerful being in the game, I have to take you through the whistle-stop tour of Gale's life, which in many ways is a tour of the entire game from beginning to end, not from the view of the lords, but from the narrative of the forgotten Dark Soul. The main narrative of the Dark Souls games is through the eyes of Gwyn, but if we are to flip the script and tell the story through the eyes of the forgotten class of men, a new perspective arises. The original narration of the game tells us of three lords that waged a war against the ancients, and a fourth lord known as the Furtive Pygmy who is given little to no narrative context. As we move through the game and pay close attention to the intentionally buried details, we learn that the Furtive Pygmy played a much larger role in all aspects of the story than we are originally told to believe. The Furtive Pygmy and bearer of the Dark Soul was not just a monumental force in the most pivotal moments of history, but also is the inherent power of humans and the natural successor of the Age of Fire. The Dark Soul is said to be so powerful that after Gwyn had witnessed the power of primal men through the actions of the Ringed Knights during the Age of Ancients, he feared the source of their power and foresaw them overpowering his own age in the future. It's in this reasoning we equate Manus, the father of the Abyss and the largest aspect of the remaining furtive pygmy in Dark Souls 1, as the greatest being by quite a margin in that first list. Manus holding the greatest aspect of the Dark Soul was not only able to repel Prime Gwyn's greatest forces, but also his mere presence forced the humanity of those around his vicinity to take a new form, one that was truer to their origins as beings born from the Abyss. The Dark Soul for this reason, even in the face of three Lord Souls, including the Soul of Sunlight, was able to stand tall enough to call for its own distinction. It's no wonder why the namesake of the trilogy is also based around this aspect of the game. In this, it's likely any being close enough to harbour the totality of the Dark Soul holds the inherent power to overthrow the Soul of Sunlight. It's no coincidence that time and time again in each game from Vendrick to us as the players are always human. Because as humans, we are inheritors of the Pygmies and are the prime force able to change the world. It is exactly why the Primal Serpents and even even Gwyn look to humans and the human race as a means to their own ends. Don't just take my word for it, take Gwyn's too, as it was Gwyn who acted preemptively even during the height of his power and age of fire to curb the power of the Dark Soul. Gwyn was able to curb the power of the Dark Soul by drawing his attention to the Pygmy Lords. The origins of the Pygmy Lords are hard to say, but what we do know for certain is that the furtive Pygmy, similar to Gwyn, separated the totality of the Dark Soul and created a governing group of men known as the Pygmies. These Pygmy would later go on to become the primeval humans and therefore bear in total the largest aspect of the Dark Soul only contendable by the furtive pygmy himself. Gwyn, understanding the impracticality of waging a war against the furtive pygmy, instead utilised a much more pragmatic approach in dealing with the Dark Soul, as once the furtive pygmy lay dormant, likely awaiting the natural cycle of the fading of the Age of Fire, the Lord of Sunlight began speaking to the pygmy lords, and chose to venerate them with positions of authority and an entire city of their own under the pretense 
they accepted the then elusive dark sign. For the Pygmies, this was a gift for their servitude in the war against the Age of Ancients. The Pygmies as primeval men would later bear the race of humans that would come to populate large sections of Lordran. But unfortunately for them, they too would inherit the dark sign of their forefathers. The dark sign itself would later show its true nature as once the fading of the flame drew closer, the very race this darkening was to inspire found themselves in contradiction becoming weaker as the flames died. This is because the dark sign was no gift. It was a tool to tie the dark soul of every human to the fate of the Age of Fire, literally confining the power of the dark soul in a circular prison of fire. This is the very reason why the humans of Dark Souls hollow, as once the fires fade, their own being now tied to the first flame would begin to hollow as the darkness within each human would fight against Gwyn's subversion of nature. Gwyn would supplement this with a propaganda campaign, narrating history for all and telling humans it is in their interest to therefore sacrifice their very being to reignite the Age of Fire and reverse the hollowing just as Gwyn would. Many are undead would take heed of Gwyn's calling and many would go on to give themselves to the prophecy and die in the name of rekindling an age that inherently fought against their own interests and birthright. However, quiet rebellions would take place throughout the timeline and a certain primordial serpent would become its spearhead. Primordial Serpent Karth would inform the slumbering furtive pygmy of Gwyn's actions which would later cause the fall of Ulysil and the creation of Manus. Karth would also be responsible of teaching the four kings of New Londo of their true nature as beings of the dark and grant them the ability to use life drain. It's these actions that would later underpin the rebellion of the Dark Soul throughout the timeline as it sat in the shadow of the First Flame. From Londor, to the Queens in Dark Souls 2, to Pontiff's recognition of the Deep, and even the various undeads that would abandon the First Flame. The Dark Soul persisted regardless of its persecution, and in the end it was the Dark Soul that forces nature's hand and is left at the end of the world to finally begin its own age in peace. And who better than a lowly slave knight to carry this mantle? The slave knight in question is in a lot of ways the story of the Dark Soul and its persistence in a world that was built against it. It is the combination of every silent rebellion and the suffering of humanity at the behest of an age of gods who paid little mind to their well-being and used humans as a means to an end. The history of Gale is almost non-existent in terms of narration, and in many ways that is exactly what it's supposed to be. We learn that he was nothing but a slave knight, a being that fought and died for the powers that be without any real purpose or foresight. Gale was in every sense the fodder of war and the perfect exemplification of the ordinary humans of the world. Gale's narrative story in Dark Souls 3 begins when he makes himself known to us. In this, we learn through the countless years of death and rebirth, he had found himself in the land of Ariandel. As discussed in the entry for the Pontiff, Ariandel had become a haven for beings that had no place in the original world, a place that the outcasts found a home and those who had faced loss had found peace. It's unsurprising that the lowly slave knight would find a home here, and in time he would also find meaning too. As one characteristic we do know about Gale that stands out amongst all other undead is his willingness to give himself to a cause. But this time, the cause was one that not only fulfilled a greater calling, but one that sought to preserve a world that housed the originally oppressed. It's likely his time in Oriandel had built the yearning within Gale to fight for a cause other than that in which was ordained to him by the unforgiving gods, and instead of looking to the gods, he found himself at the feet of another otherworldly figure, known only as the painter and requesting of Gale one simple task, to find a pigment worthy of creating a world that harboured the eternal peace that Oriandel yearned for so deeply. Gale reaching out for the second time to us, the most capable human of the age, would reveal his grand plan, to travel to the land of the forgotten pygmy lords and reclaim the entirety of the Dark Soul. For only the Dark Soul, untainted by the dialectical antagonisms of the Age of Fire, can know true peace and were upmost deserving of being given a home away from the shackles of the Dark Sign. 
While navigating us, Gale battles through the convoluted land of the Ringed City, helping us lay claim to ancient beings such as the Demon Prince, and eventually having disrupted the fabric of time itself, we meet Gale again at the end of the world, covered in ash and brought to a ruin by Gale. Gale has consumed every single aspect of the Dark Soul here but our own, and we even see his final consumption of the last Pygmy Lord. Bloated with the mass of the Dark Soul within him, we face off against Gale, and what is most important here is that we are not just fighting a slave knight anymore, we are against the exact mirror image of ourselves, for at the end of the world, us, the player, as we control Gale's chosen human, have become canonical to the storyline. In this, Gale, specific to the law, becomes the humanity of every undead we have controlled through every installment of the game, every god we have slain every challenge we shouldn't have been able to overcome, but did. Gale's strength is the strength of the greatest aspect of the Dark Soul at this point. As we fight him, he literally bleeds the Dark Soul. In this, he brings back memories of Manus, a being that's very presence brought to life sprites of humanity. But his strength is not just a reflection of the furtive pygmy, he is also the mirror image of every character we have ever played. It's fitting that Gale is the final boss, as after three whole games of fighting against beings as the chosen undead, it's fitting that our last obstacle is yet another chosen undead, one that harbours the totality of the strength of humanity, but also the loss pride, ambition, and history of humans in totality. Gale is humanity's final act in the world of Dark Souls, the last speech of not only the furtive pygmy, but also his oppressed children. In his final moments, he recognises us as the final aspect of the Dark Soul remaining. And if we best him, we obtain the Dark Soul of man, a worthy pigment for a new world and fulfilment of the wishes of a lowly slave knight who sacrificed himself not at the altar of the lords, but at the behest of those unkindled. Gale is the most powerful being in Dark Souls 3, and arguably the entire series. Gale is not just Manus, or even the furtive pygmy. He is every story of humanity as they fought for their place in this world, every memory of humans gone hollow. He is the story of Vendrick, the people of Mirror, the knights of Astora, the shadow of the eastern lands, the culture of Ulasil, the joys of Katarina, magic of Vinheim. He is the hue of Berenike and Balder, merchants of Xena, faith of Thoraland, but most importantly, he is the heroes of Lordran, Lothric, and Drang Lake. If you made it all the way to the end of the video, I have a question for you. I'm currently working on Elden Ring Ranked by Lore. This is likely going to be a multi-part series and will take a bunch of my time. My question is, would you rather I spent the time and worked on this immediately, or alternatively, worked through games such as Bloodborne and Sekiro first? Comment what you guys think, I use your insights to really navigate this channel, so please feel free to leave your thoughts on what you'd like to see next. Thanks for watching.